Okay, welcome back to Genesis Bible Study, Genesis chapter 25, verses 8 through 26. Genesis 25, 8 through 26. Good to be here today. Hope you're doing well. We're going to go through some scripture and learn a lot about God's plan for his people and God's fulfillment of his promises. We start here at verse 8. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Well, how old was Abraham when he died? He was 175 years old. That's incredible. That's 105 years more than we're promised in the Bible. Now, there's scripture there. It says, uh, essentially, if you uh, are fortunate enough, you'll live uh, three score and 10, which is 70 years. And here Abraham lived 175. And a lesson that we see from verse eight, when we see that uh, just the way it's written, then Abraham gave up the ghost and he died in good old age. You know, it's not just old age, but good old age. An old man, they want you to make sure you understand is old here. And then full of years. So we've got good old age, old man, full of years. What's the Bible trying to tell us? The Bible is trying to tell us that when we live for the Lord, when we're obedient to God, when we are um, faithful to what God has entrusted us to do, we are blessed oftentimes with old age. And we see a threefold mention of the old age. And every time I read verse eight, I always think of just you know, they could have just written that once. And, you know, the threefold mentioning of it is a, a, a use of repetition that God wants us to know in case maybe we're slack when we're reading and maybe we're, our mind is drifting. God says, okay, you missed the first one. You're going to pick up on the second. You missed the second one. I'm going to make sure you understand the third. But basically, it all comes down to this. Not basically, truly, it all comes down to when we serve God, we live for God, we're blessed oftentimes with old age. And you say, well, Brother Clark, why would I want to be blessed with old age if heaven is the promised land and heaven is perfect and heaven is all this great stuff? Well, it's a blessing to live. Um, there's many reasons why. I mean, one thinking in heavenly terms, when we live for the Lord uh, here on earth, we can accumulate rewards, um, stature even in heaven. I believe that. Uh, you say, well, how would I know that? I mean, Jesus told the disciples when they asked what their reward would be, he explained that they would rule over the 12 tribes in Israel, uh, each one of the disciples there in heaven. That was their reward for being faithful and obedient. Um, and so the more time we're here on earth, the more reward we can have in heaven. And of course, you want to get into rewards. You have to talk about the Bema seat, the judgment, and is what we doing, or is what we're doing going to burn up? Is it going to be wood, hay, and stubble? Or is it going to be like uh, gold that uh, will not melt in the fire? Amen. Precious stones. And so our intentions are have to be um, the right way. We have to do what God calls us to do for the right reason. You know, we the one I always like to mention is do we go out and say, feed the homeless and make a big Facebook post about it? You know, when we do that, we have our reward. We've told others about it. We have we have sacrificed a heavenly reward for the reward of our ego or for our uh, our attention and all these things. Now, when you go out and you feed the homeless and you tell them this is in Jesus' name and no one else knows you did it, now that's a reward that God, uh, I believe, will, will, will be willing to give you because you are doing it in Jesus' name. You are spreading the gospel message. You are serving in love. You are taking care of the needy and all these things, and you're doing it without any type of exposure, wanting any kind of validation from the world, which we're told not to do. And I'm not going to preach on social media, but I will say that I turned all mine off. We've got one for church, and uh, there's a, a, a one that we use. Uh, I use for work in sense of um, marketing and stuff, but I don't have any personal social media. I turned it off several years ago because I came to the conclusion that whatever good you can do on there by sharing uh, scripture and messages and trying to witness to people is oftentimes offset by the just the wickedness of the networks, the vanity around it. And so I'm well aware that yes, we upload these to social media, we share on social media, but at the same time, the social media culture is vain and that vanity leads to nothing but destruction and depression and children these days are being indoctrinated with it. There was a study that came out recently about how at 14 is the peak age for kids to get addicted to social media. And that was the 14 was the peak time for our teenager of having to wrestle it away from him. So parents out there, don't give your kids social media if you can help it. And adults out there, disconnect, shut it off it, you, you, and, and say, well, what am I going to do with my time? Pick up the Bible, pray, 
spend time with God, watch a Bible study. I'm telling you, you will be happier for it. But anyways, this is Genesis 25, 28 through 26, not social media crackdown. So I'll go on here, but you get the idea. It's blessed to live for the Lord. Oftentimes we are blessed with old age when we do things that are in obedience to him. And when we live longer here, we can enjoy more rewards there. And uh, there's also, I think, some uh, discussion in the Bible about how the angels didn't do what we did. I mean, the angels weren't given a, a sinful body and asked to make a decision for Christ, right? It was totally different. And so we as humans are, um, we are co-heirs with Christ. And there's a lot to that. Uh, as we live on this earth, that our inheritance uh, can grow through the rewards that we gain by serving him. And if we are serving him and we're obedient to him and he gives us more years, that gives us more opportunity to stack up that treasure in heaven where it won't decay, it won't rust, moth can't get at it. And I believe that is the idea. And just to clarify, we are not uh, in danger of losing our salvation. We can't work. We cannot add anything that Jesus did uh, on the cross, we can't had add anything to it. Amen. So we're not working for salvation. We are just working for heavenly reward. Okay. Uh, scripture to back up this idea before you start thinking this guy is just going off on his own opinion. Isaiah forty thirty one. But they that wait upon the Lord, that idea of wait, waiting upon the Lord. Yes, waiting for His return, but also waiting as in serving, like a waiter, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. You ever see an eagle? It's an awesome thing to see an eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So we have this idea of renewal of strength. There's some great scripture that for uh, time's sake, I didn't put in here, but the idea that day by day, God renews our strength, even though we're weak, even though we are sometimes just emptied out and, and just laid bare. And you say, gosh, old age, is that what I really want to be blessed with? But God will renew our strength. So it's a twofold blessing. When we serve God, he'll give us more days a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times. Uh, and at the same time, when he gives us more days, he'll renew our strength to serve him as he would have us to do, to be obedient to him. And it's such a blessing to have God renew your strength. Maybe there's times that you have gone into a battle and said, I don't know how I can deal with this. And then as you go through that battle, you say to yourself, wow, I have more strength than I thought I would. I have more peace than I thought I would. Well, where did that come from? That came from God Almighty. Amen. That came from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Titus 2.2 that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. I put Titus 2, 2, 2 in here to line that up with Abraham's behavior. He was definitely sober. He did not seem like someone that was a belligerent or making a bunch of wild moves. He seemed very much calculated, in touch with God. Remember, very humble when he purchased Sarah, Sarah's burial plot. He was even bowing to the children in humility. Again, God had promised him all the land, and he still went and bought it, purchased it. Uh, and so very humble, very sober, uh, very grave. Uh, he knew what was going on. He was very down to earth, uh, temperate, very temperate, didn't want to uh, fight or have problems. Another exa example of his temperance, um, his meekness might be when he went and had to go get Lot and the Sodomites back and they try to give him uh, earthly rewards. And he said, I won't take anything other than the food you gave to the soldiers. I'm not going to take anything. Sound in faith. Abraham was very sound in faith. Abraham was justified by his faith. He was given um, special place in God's plan because he had faith. He believed in God and God gave him a challenge by leaving Ur the Chaldees there in Babylon area and having to go to the Canaan land, which he didn't know anything about. That was a challenge. He was leaving uh, an area that was developed to an area that was not. And there was famine in the new area. There was a challenge there. Uh, he was challenged many times. And uh, he was challenged in the idea that he was going to have Isaac at such an old age. It would be preposterous. And God saying, believe me, do you not believe me? And Abraham said, yes, Father, I believe you. And uh, in charity, I believe he was very giving, uh, very, very giving, uh, certainly uh, involved with, we see that when he was giving a lot to Rebecca in that situation uh, and giving, uh, another example would be in charity uh, when I think it was Lot's uh, sheep herders and his sheep herders got into arguments and they, and, and he just told Lot, Hey, you just pick where you want to go and we'll, I'll go the other way, so to speak. And so he's very giving in charity and in patience. Abraham was very patient. He was 175 years old when he passed and he, uh, he just exuded patience in many ways as we read about him. So we see the patriarch, patriarch, father Abraham, the father of God's chosen people, the Israelites, uh, 
embodied all these things. And so we see that in Titus 2, 2. And then here's the clearest reference in scripture that I could find to God prolonging your life if you're obedient. Uh, in Deuteronomy 5, 33, yea, shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that ye may may live and that it may be well with you and that ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. So here is the, here is do this. And then here is get that. Ye shall walk in the ways which the Lord God had commanded you. Okay. Do what God says, be obedient, follow his commandments. Right. And then what happens? Then you're going to live. It'll be well with you and you prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. Okay. So it's very applicable. Serve the Lord. The Lord will prolong your days. Uh, contemporary examples. I can give a few. Again, not everybody that's a Christian that serves God lives a long time. You can think of martyrs uh, that, that are have great status, I'm sure, in heaven that God had a great favor with that didn't live a long time. But of course, uh, Enoch walked with the Lord, uh, what was it, 300 some years? Um, he, you know, he prolonged his days, but contemporary examples, uh, I think of Billy Graham living as long as he did. And I mentioned in our church, it's interesting. He lived almost to a hundred, I believe it is. Uh, and his wife passed before he did. And typically that that's kind of rare. Usually, uh, the woman lives, uh, significantly longer than men. In fact, a surprising statistic, uh, that I heard on the radio one time that I about fell over, uh, the widow rate of women over 65 was really high because at that point, the women, the woman keeps living and men oftentimes pass. And I believe this is true. And you start really looking at it. And yet Billy Graham lived longer, significantly longer than his wife. Uh, one of my favorite Bible teachers who's taught me a lot, Les Feldick, uh, to my knowledge, he's still alive up there in his 80s, 90s. Uh, and he served the Lord. He was just a cattle rancher. And he's testified on his show about how God has just prospered him with good health. And he's lived a long time. And he wasn't rich in any kind of worldly fashion in terms of money, but God prospered his ministry. And he and uh, he lived a long time. And as my, I understand it, that man uh, up until just maybe even a few years ago was, was teaching Bible classes six nights a week, unbelievably, sometimes driving hours away. And so you see people that, that give and give and give and they're obedient to God and God blesses them oftentimes with old age. Not always. Uh, there is scripture that mentions the inverse that God may take a saint, a, a saint of God home to be with him because he's sparing that person from what will be in the future. That was one of them. But oftentimes old age, Job again, comes to mind many others. Okay. Uh, and then we hear on verse nine and his sons, Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelia in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, which is before Mamre. Wow. So here we see the reunion of Isaac and Ishmael, Isaac and Ishmael, the brothers. Remember they were fighting as, you know, uh, Isaac was like an infant, but Ishmael was a little bit older, uh, but they were fighting. And, and remember, Ishmael was banished, right? And so Isaac and Ishmael buried him together. That tells us what? That tells us there was some kind of um, patching up of the relationship, or maybe they had been close. I think that also tells us that Abraham was still involved in Ishmael's life, even after um, he had been banished uh, to Paran. How old were they? This is crazy. They buried their dad when Isaac was 75 and Ishmael was 89. That's unbelievable to think they were that old when they were burying their dad. But Abraham did live a long time uh, and they were no longer at odds. Another idea here is that Ishmael was close by in the wilderness of Paran. And we can kind of look a little bit of where that might have been uh, in a bit here. And another important point of seeing Isaac and Ishmael together uh, burying their dad, God took care of Ishmael as he promised. You know, God always keeps his promises. God does not uh, ever get involved in like um, fake talk or shallow talk or fal false promises. God doesn't do that. God is not a liar and he's not mocked. Amen. And he keeps his word. And here we see in Genesis 17, 20. Uh, so some chapters back in Genesis, this is what God had promised uh, Hagar uh, and, and Abraham. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. And so we see that God did that, that he had blessed him uh, and that God had come through on his promise. And I think the idea to, to picture a 75-year-old Isaac and 89-year-old Ishmael together burying their dad in that cave there in the tomb of the patriarchs, that kind of says it all. Uh, you know, if you have a chosen one now and you have another one 
that's banished by the bond woman. You have the bond woman not getting along with the, the, the former uh, master and, and all of these problems. And, you know, you just imagine how hard it would be to have these families ever speak again, but God allowed it to be, he allowed it to happen uh, out of respect, I believe for Abraham. Uh, and again, Ishmael was a result of Abraham and Sarah's own idea going their own way. So this is another example of God's mercy and grace because he didn't have to do that. He could have easily done a lot of other things there, but he allowed them to be together and to bless it. Uh, let's see here. Verse 10, the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried and Sarah, his wife. This is the tomb of the patriarchs, which you can still go to today. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son, Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by La, La Iroy. La Iroy. I, I'm going to butcher some names here, but you're used to it if you've listened to me before. And it's just my way of showing that, you know, we're all human, right? La Iroy. Okay, so that's um, where Isaac dwelt. Very interesting how the scripture kind of pivots. It lets it know, lets us know, hey, they buried him and so forth. This is where it was at. Uh, and then it's right back to God blessed Isaac. God blessed Isaac. Uh, and because, of course, Isaac is the chosen one of the family line to carry it on to quickly introduce the 12 tribes. Now, these are the generations of Ishmael. So now we go back to Ishmael again, and we're going to look at these ge uh, generations in regard to what God promised, because God promised um, that he's going to bless them exceedingly, and there's going to be 12 princes and a great nation. And so we see here, uh, these are names of Ishmael, by their names according to their generation, uh, the firstborn of Ishmael, Neba Joth and Kadar and Ab Adbeel and Mibsam and Mishma and Duma and Masa and Hadar and Tema and Jedar and Nafish and Kadma. Uh, these are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their towns and by their castles, 12 princes according to their nations. And so we see 12, and there's a lot happening here in this scripture, which many people would just do what I did. They would read through, try to pronounce it, and keep moving on. But there's actually a lot going on here that, that I think is very interesting. Uh, number one, there's 12, right? So God promised 12, there's 12. Number two, it mentions castles. Well, if you look at this region, it was barren, barren desert. And so there's probably not actual castles as we think, or the translator wrote castles, but it could have been something to the extent of tents, or, or buildings of some kind. Uh, and this is uh, Arabia, as we understand it. This is Arabia. So we have more of the promise of God coming to fruition. The 12 princes are his sons uh, and comprising a great nation. This is the Arab nation in the wilderness. Uh, and it's not clearly uh, linked to one group. You can't say that all Muslims come from Ishmael or all Arabians though it is the root of the Arab uh, people. But it's it's very easy, I think, to back then they might call them Mohammedans or now they might say Ishmaelites. But it, it, as I've researched this, nobody can trace, say, uh, Islam back to Ishmael uh, himself. Some Muslims, as I understand it, want to do that, but there doesn't seem to be that clear uh, genealogy like we have in the Bible to point to that. So I uh, can't do that. And then one of the most interesting things that I noticed here is there's the 12 princes. Well, what does the number 12 sig signify? Well, it signifies the 12 tribes of Israel, does it not? And so you see a first example or an earthly example followed by a heavenly example. And so our first example is the 12 princes, right? But they're not the promised line. God often uses the fleshly or earthly uh first, and then secondly, godly. You can think of that in the term of the first Adam and the last Adam. The first Adam was flawed and sinful, right? The last Adam is Jesus Christ. You can think of Cain and then Abel, right? Uh, coming very soon here, we got Esau and then Jacob, right? And you can go on and on. God will often use the worldly or earthly first, followed by the heavenly. And so we see that here, this first 12, it's not of the promised line. Uh, and these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. And he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. And so 137 years, one little quick Bible study tip. We can go back here. We can see that Abraham lived 175 years uh, when he died. And we can see um, 
that that how old uh, Ishmael was when he buried him. Okay, uh, 89 years old. And then you can look and say, okay, if he was 89 when he buried him, and the scripture says that he lived 137 years, you could say, okay, what's that? Uh, 89 plus one is 90. So plus 47. So he lived 48 more years, if my math is correct. Uh, so you realize that timeline. Okay, this is how much longer he lived after Abraham, what he could have done at that point. And we see here where they dwelt. Uh, this is the 12 princes and presumably the dad, uh, Ishmael. Uh, and they dwelt uh, from Havilah unto Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest toward Assyria. And he died in the presence of all his brethren. And so we see here a map. And this map, I believe, is from Wikimedia. I got it from a Bible study website. But I think it's from Wikimedia of, uh, initially. We see modern day Saudi Arabia. Uh, we can see Israel up here in the uh, upper corner, and we see Shur uh, to Havilah, and we see modern-day Iraq. You see a lot of Iraq, and you see Jordan and Amman. And um, Iraq, by the way, is where Babylon, modern-day Babylon, uh, would be. And you see here roughly uh, where this uh, Arabian group or the 12 princes dwelled. And again, um, when you research this, like, for example, I was trying to get a very firm place for uh, Paran, the wilderness of Paran, and I couldn't find anybody that had definitive answers. A lot of people were guessing. Uh, but uh, this gives you an idea of the scope of Israel being up here. And remember, they, they left uh, the promised land and they were kind of banished and so forth. And they were kind of bordering Egypt. They're sure kind of bordering Egypt all the way over kind of through Iraq, bordering the Persian Gulf on the other side. And that is roughly where these 12 tribes were uh, located of Ishmael, the 12 tribes of Ishmael. And then the scripture moves on very quickly. And again, nothing is by accident in the scripture. The scripture wanted to give you God's promise fulfilled, and it did. The scripture wants to give you the names of all these tribes, and it did. The scripture wants to let you know where they were, and it did. And now the scripture is saying, look, turn back and look at the 12 tribes of Israel. So we had the earthly, and now we're going to have the godly. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Uh, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, uh, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Paderim, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Uh, and so we see here, immediately going to Isaac. And then we know that Isaac is eventually going to have Esau and Jacob, and Jacob is going to be um, it renamed Israel and the father of the 12 tribes. Uh, and we see here, Isaac prayed for his wife in uh, verse 21 uh, because she was barren. And so Isaac prayed for his wife. Do we pray for our spouse, knowing that God is able to do the supernatural? We need to pray for our significant others, our spouses, uh, our, our family members. We need to pray because that's what Isaac did. That's what Abraham had done. That's what we need to do. That is a contemporary uh, thing that has never gone out of style. Prayer has never been uh, expired. Prayer has never become old fashioned. Prayer is just important today as it was then. Um, who else had been barren? Think about this. So we see that Isaac, he's 40. Okay. When he, when he got married, it's interesting too, to think that we see in the previous chapter of Genesis, Isaac meeting Rebecca. And so that might cue us to how old he was at that point. But he's 40 when he marries Re uh, Rebecca and she's barren. Who else was barren? Sarah was barren. See the parallel? God allowed this burden to fall to Isaac too. And so we have the same issue uh, that Isaac's father Abraham, right, had when uh, Sarah was barren. And now God has allowed this to fall to Rebecca. And the question is, why? Why would God allow that to happen? Uh, my answer would be to test the faith of Isaac. You know, God's sovereign. People sometimes read this and say, oh, well, she's human. It just was her nature, or her design. It didn't, you know, just some kind of defect. No, God allowed her to be barren to test the faith of Isaac. Isaac knew that he was to be the, uh, you know, the, the, the father of this line along with Abraham and, and the others, that he was so important in this. He knew this. So was his faith real? Was he going to go to God and entreat God and ask God to allow him to have children? Or was he going to say, oh, you know, this is just life and I'll just go on. 
you know, too many times in life, we just go with the flow. We just go with what the world tells us. Surely Isaac had maybe worldly people that he would you know, work with or see who would tell him, oh, that's just how it is. Don't worry about it. Get you a concubine, just like Abraham and Sarah had concocted up with Hagar. But Isaac saw that. He saw that it didn't go good. He turned to God and he begged God. He entreated God that he'd have children. And he passed that test of faith. He passed it. Here we see in verse 22, and the children struggled with her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. This is the children in her womb. Okay. So now that she's pregnant, this is the children in her womb, right? Uh, because we see here in verse 21, Rebecca conceived. So we know that she conceived. Now she's pregnant and they struggled with her. Anyone that's had a bad pregnancy understands what that's like. And she went to the Lord and inquired of the Lord. And we see the Lord directly answer her. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. So we see here first that Rebecca prayed while dealing with a tough pregnancy. If you're going through a tough time today, pray to God. You have health issues, pray to God. You have dealing with a tough pregnancy, pray to God. She entreated God. She was godly. And what did he do? He responded very clearly to her. He, God himself answers her. Uh, again, this is very interesting because um, I don't want to draw too many parallels, but you know, with Sarah, she laughed when God said she was going to have a child in old age, right? And there was, uh, you know, Sarah was still very blessed for what happened by, by having Isaac and so forth, but it was a little different. We see here that she's praying, just honestly saying, you know, Lord, if it be so, why am I dealing with this? And she inquired of the Lord and he answered, and he also gives prophecy to the future of Jacob and Esau. So those two children, those two nations that are in her womb are Jacob and Esau, and they were fighting. And so we see Jacob again, going right to God's people, the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob had 12 sons, right? And these are the 12 tribes. These are the ones that go into Egypt as just them and come out uh, close to a million or over a million uh, in the Red Sea uh, exodus. And then who was Esau? Esau was the older brother. Esau is the head of the uh, Edomites, and they were pagans. They're enemies of Israel. And Esau had five sons. And you can spend a lot of time reading about the Edomites and it's oftentimes not a good story, not a good picture. And so we see here clearly that God was giving prophecy, saying very clearly, these are the two nations in her womb and two manner of people. And it's, God actually tells Rebecca right here, it's amazing how God can speak like a sentence. I think this is one sentence or one or two sentences. I think it's one with some semicolons. God can speak a sentence, and this could be like a hundred books written about this. It's incredible what God can do in his wisdom, the way that God speaks. And so God speaks in this wisdom. He's telling her prophecy, saying these two groups will not get along and the younger will be stronger than the older, or, or excuse me, uh, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. And we can see that, that the Israelites eventually gain power over the Edomites and that eventually the Edomites are wiped out later on. Uh, and so the, that's Jacob's, the younger gains power over the elder. And we know as it comes up in scripture, that Jacob steals the birthright, uh, from Esau over a bowl of soup. Uh, and then, um, well, excuse me, Jacob, yes, uh, takes that over the bowl of soup and then, uh, ends up conning the father to get the blessing. That's what it was as well. Uh, and so Jacob has, uh, the upper hand, even though he's the younger and in this, uh, uh, society, the elder was the one that was entitled to everything. That's why Ishmael had to be expelled when he was expelled, because technically he would have been the elder. But since he was a child of the bondwoman, it didn't matter. And because he was expelled, it didn't matter. Uh, just a parallel to kids relating in the womb. So we see here, Sarah saying, what's going on in my womb? I'm having so much trouble. And there's always this one verse that sticks out. The first time I read this many years ago, I about fell out of my chair because I didn't know it was in the Bible. And I texted my preacher at the time and said, did you know this was in the Bible? I can't believe this. Uh, Luke 1 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the sal salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. So Elizabeth, I believe, was a cousin 
of Mary, and she had John the Baptist in her womb. And Mary, of course, had been uh, was conceiving Jesus through the the virgin conception of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so, when Mary uh, had uh, when um, Elizabeth had heard the salutation, so Mary's going to the house saying hello, going to talk to her cousin. The babe, which is John the Baptist, uh, leaped in her womb because the Holy Spirit. And uh, was there. Amen. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And so we see another example of the womb mentioned in the Bible. And we see John the Baptist and uh, Jesus, and they're excited for each other to see each other. Certainly John the Baptist was excited to see Jesus. And so we see one year where you got two in the womb and they're fighting and they're warring. Uh, and the other, of course, was a little bit more of a happy meeting. And I believe, just uh, touch on this real quick, that the idea of this scripture in Luke Deals with the, uh, deals with how God prepared Mary for that virgin birth and for what she was going to see and do uh, through mothering Jesus in the season. Uh, God was preparing her by visiting Elizabeth, who had her own story to tell about how John the Baptist uh, had been conceived and named and so forth. And so I believe God was preparing her, and God often will do that. He will prepare us before we go into a season, and we won't even know that we're being prepared, but that's why he's the good shepherd, and that's why we trust him to lead us. Amen. All right, wrapping it up here, uh, moving right along, uh, verse 24. And when her days were to be delivered, uh, to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare him. Uh, and so why Esau's heel? Why was Jacob coming out on Esau's heel? I had to... I had a couple ideas, but I had to research this. And number one, uh, twins at that time typically would be born uh, a little bit apart. And the idea that he was holding on to Esau's heel is stating uh, the rare medical case where the twins were born almost simultaneously. So one comes out, another immediately comes out. Uh, at the same time, the idea that he was holding Esau's heel or had him by the heel was that he was going to be getting ahead of Esau, that even though he was the younger one, he was going to end up first or he was going to carry over him, the idea of uh, maybe two children chasing each other, and the one that's behind, the younger one is chasing the elder, and grabs that younger uh, the elder one's heel and pulls the elder one down as the younger one moves forward, and that is essentially what happened there. And how old was Isaac when they married? Uh, he was 40, and he it says uh, now he was three score years old when they had a child. Uh, Isaac was three score years old, and three score means 60, so they were married 20 years and they had these two children. And that just, again, gives you, puts into context how old they were uh, when all of this was happening. Uh, again, uh, from the math that I got, uh, when uh, the burial of Abraham took place, um, Isaac was 75. So that we could, again, trace back that uh, Abraham was able to see these children before he passed and uh, for 15 years or so. Amen. So we see just a very interesting chapter here, Genesis 25, 8 through 26, and we see the root of the tribes of Israel coming. We see details about God fulfilling his promise for Ishmael and his 12 children. And we see here uh, just looking forward to what's going to happen uh, between Jacob and Esau and how it will all end up uh, with these 12 tribes of Israel uh, going into Egypt. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in, and I will be back soon. Take care.